Hello everyone, welcome to my talk about wildlife rehabilitation and veganism, conflicts and solutions. So as you can imagine, this talk is going to be about what it's like being a vegan who works in wildlife rehabilitation and the problems that you face on a day-to-day -day or less common basis. So a really quick introduction about myself. I've been vegan for just under seven and a half years now. I went to the University of Aberdeen to study zoology because I wanted to help animals. I didn't know in what capacity I wanted to do this. I just knew that I wanted to. And then almost by accident, I started wildlife rescue. So at first, my partner and I would just find animals around Aberdeen that needed help. And through doing this, my friends and other people would phone us whenever they found an injured animal. And through that, we got to know the local wildlife rescue centre because we'd always be bringing them animals to use uh, their aviaries. And through that, I got to know the people working there and I ended up getting a job there. So that's really how it began. So on the left, you can see a pigeon in my old living room and a herring gull in the shower who's looking very grumpy, but he'd just been stuck in a chimney. So he was covered in a lot of soot and they were both fine and they both got released. And on the right hand side is me working at two different wildlife rescue centres. So second from the right is myself with the world's biggest hedgehog. And on the right is myself probably just a month or two ago with a sparrowhawk. So this talk isn't what wildlife rehabilitation is like in general, but I think it's a good background just to give really quickly about what it is like. So wildlife rehabilitation is emotional and intense. It's very full on. There's long hours, you're always blaming yourself when something goes wrong, there's a lot of animals, and you feel like there's never really enough hours in the day. There's a lot of cleaning involved, which I don't mind at all, I actually really enjoy it, but I think it's underestimated just how much cleaning there really is involved in wildlife rehabilitation. Um, you do deal with demanding public a lot. And so this little comic strip kind of shows a little example of it here, which is maybe dramatised a little bit, but we do really do deal with that sort of thing. I think a lot of people see wildlife rehabilitation as a service to them, as in humans, rather than to animals. And that is a problem that we encounter. And I'm going to mention it more in the conflict section of this talk. But they can be quite hard to deal with when people say you need to drop everything and come and get an animal now, which you really just don't have time to do, especially in summer. There are so many animals that come in. So we're very, very busy. But wildlife rescue is also educational. You see things which in day-to-day -day life you wouldn't get to see. So I've seen fledgling birds feeding other fledgling birds, which isn't something I expected. And another wildlife rescue centre I worked at, apparently there was once a pigeon feeding a baby starling in the same aviary, which is really interesting because pigeons feed each other by regurgitating into the other one's mouth. But this pigeon was picking up bits of food and putting it in the starling's beak, which isn't something which pigeons are known to do. So you do learn things about these animals which you just wouldn't expect and it is really educational and really amazing and through this in other ways it's also completely rewarding so you'll sometimes have an animal come in which is really ill or really injured and then a few weeks later even months they get to be released again and it's really really amazing to see so you kind of go through all the emotions in wildlife rehabilitation you invest a lot but you get a lot out of it as well so conflict I've separated this into two sections. So the first is just sort of general conflicts which wildlife rehabilitators deal with. And the bottom section is probably a bit more linked to veganism. Although there's definitely crossover between both sections. So the first conflict is keeping animals wild. I think the first instinct of a lot of people when they see an animal, especially a little baby mammal, is to put on a baby voice and go, oh, they're so cute. And they want to hug them, cuddle them. But this is exactly what a wildlife rehabilitator needs to avoid. So you have to do the complete opposite of what comes naturally. And in fact, this fox here you can see in the picture is actually one that was tamed too much by volunteers a few years ago. So he lives now permanently in captivity. But keeping animals wild is extremely important. So you have to go against your natural instinct. If you're going into a pen with fox cubs, for example, and they're behaving a little too tamely, you need to take in rustly bags and tools and bash around and make them terrified of you. Which obviously, not just as a vegan, but as a human, goes against every natural instinct you have. But it's what you need to do and it's best for them because when it comes around to them being released, you need them to have a fear of humans. Because unfortunately, not all people are nice to foxes or any animal, unfortunately. Non-releasable animals. This is another conflict that wildlife rehabilitators experience. 
And that's because some animals are unreleasable due to a disability, but they can still live. So in simple terms, you might say, well, if that happens, just get an aviary for them or an enclosure for them, put them in there and they can live out their life. But what you need to remember, these aren't companion animals. These are wild animals which are terrified of you. And if you put an animal in there that could live another 1, 10, 15 years, they're going to spend every single day of their life terrified of you. If they come in as an adult, they won't necessarily tame up at all, let alone a lot. Most stay as wild throughout their whole life, even if they're with you for years. So you're keeping an animal which is going to be terrified of you. It can't exhibit natural behaviours or eat natural food or, or capture its food. It won't be able to travel the miles that it would in a day for some species. There's also space constraints as well. So if you've got a wildlife rescue centre, you might have thousands of animals coming in every single year and you need all the space you can get. If you kept even 5% of the animals which come into you, you'd run out of space very quickly and very soon you wouldn't be able to take in any more animals, which completely goes against the point of what you're doing. So it's not nice knowing that some animals have to be put to sleep just because they're unreleasable, but having seen both sides of this, the keeping terrified animals permanently and releasing, uh, sorry, and putting to sleep, I actually do now think that putting them to sleep is the kinder option because it's quality over quantity. They're going to spend their whole life terrified, quite likely, and not in a natural environment or with others of their own species necessarily. So I do think that if they're unreleasable, they do just need to be put to sleep. It's not about us feeling good about ourselves, it's about what's best for them. And you may disagree with me, but I've seen it firsthand and I definitely feel that way about it now. So the inability to help everyone is a difficult one. You'll sometimes get someone phone up and they find an animal that's injured and they say to you they can't do anything about it. They can't pick it up, they can't get a friend to pick it up, not even literally just pick it up. And sometimes this does happen, but they then put the onus of this onto you and it's on your conscience then. And if you're busy, there's just nothing you can do about it. You can't leave the hundreds of animals relying on you in that moment to go and find an animal which may have gone or been predated by the time you get there. You just can't. So it really is a conflict because it's not nice knowing there's an animal lying there with no one looking out for it. And you can sometimes ask people to go out themselves, but it is usually just members of the public who aren't necessarily trained in what to do or who won't necessarily know exactly where to look or exactly what to do when they find the animal. So it's, it's not really something that's always doable. Sometimes you just need someone to wait with the animal until someone goes there if it's a harder to handle animal, but some people refuse to do that as well. And by the way, myself using the word it to describe animals is something I'm gonna talk about in the use of language section below. So self-projecting is a massive, massive thing for wildlife rehabilitators, something which I think every wildlife rehabber has probably dealt with, and it's extremely frustrating. So it usually involves baby mammals or fledgling birds, which someone will find, and either they'll keep the bird themselves, or even give them to their children, who might be six or seven, and they'll self-project. So basically they'll try and rear it themselves as a, a nice little project. And I say nice, but it really isn't because they so often make mistakes. They'll feed them the wrong thing. For example, uh, I've had a vegan who found a baby hare and they didn't feed it cow's milk, which is a bad thing to do, but they did feed it soy milk because they were vegan. And soy milk's fine for us, but it's not something you should be rearing a baby mammal or anything on. And then there's the issue of how they feed it. They might not know how to do it properly. You get animals coming into wildlife rehab centres who are basically drowning because they've got water or other fluid in their lungs. And then you get strange treatment of wounds as well. I think the only time you should really be treating an animal's wound if you aren't a wildlife rehabilitator or obviously a vet or a vet nurse is just to stem bleeding. Other than that, you should leave it to the people who've done it before who know how to treat a wound. Other problems with self-projecting are that people always seem to bring you the animals once they're now dying. They'll keep the animal for a week, realise that it's suddenly not doing so well and then bring it into you, by which point they're unsavable. And then sometimes they have the cheek to blame you because it died in your care, not in their care. So they think it's something that they did it right and you didn't. And it's, it's just horrible seeing an animal come in, which sometimes didn't even need picked up in the first place, who's then dying because of something that someone else did. And they know that they should have brought it in straight away, but they wanted a project. And I think this is a crossover into veganism because 
animals are not ours to use and animals are definitely not ours to be projects. They're not our entertainment. They're not something for our kids to do in the summer holidays when they're bored. They're a life in the same way as you wouldn't treat a human or a companion animal who was injured if you didn't know what you're doing. You shouldn't do the same for a wild animal. They're equal to humans and uh, companion animals in that sense. Scale of operation underestimated, that's just a really brief one. So basically people will turn up and they might talk to you for a very long time. It, it might be about something really interesting. They might be really friendly or they might want a tour uh, or just basically they'll want to take up more of your time than you can really give. Scale of the operation is definitely underestimated by a lot of people, especially when you tell them how many animals you're currently looking after. As a wildlife rehabilitator, most, I don't know about most, but a lot of centres don't have someone who's just a receptionist. So every moment I'm talking to a member of the public or telling them, I'm sorry, I don't have time to give you a tour and then having them get annoyed at me because of that, I should be tending to those animals and the animals have to be the priority. I mention human centrism a lot in this talk. And again, I think that links to veganism because there's a belief that humans are the most important thing and that anything involving animals should at some point involve them and their entertainment kind of like a zoo, which is not what wildlife rescues are. So pest control and translocation expectations. We do sometimes get people phone up saying, I've got X animal in my garden, how do I deter them? I don't really mind this too much because while personally I would say, well, don't deter them, enjoy them. I'd rather someone phones me up and either I can give them advice or get them in contact with a non-lethal organization than they would call lethal pest control. So I'd rather they contacted me because of that. But at the same time, I think back to the human centrism point that people see wildlife rescues as a human service rather than a charity that exists for animals, not human, not humans. And the translocation expectations are when people phone up and they say, I've got, again, X animal in my garden. If you don't take it, I'm going to do something about it or I'm going to get rid of it myself. And you'd think that hedgehogs are a really popular animal, but I've now dealt with two hedgehogs coming into wildlife rescue centres for that exact reason, because people just didn't want them in their garden. One person thought that having a hedgehog living in their garden would devalue the property of their house when they were selling it. And the other person was worried that their children would get ill because of the hedgehog droppings in the garden. And again, we're not here for that. We're not a human pest control service, but at the same time, I'd rather retook them than that person dealt with it themselves. So what ifs and let nature take its course? It's hard to make judgment calls sometimes. There's a lot of species of birds, for example, blackbirds, robins, dunnocks, sparrows, who when they leave the nest as fledglings, hop about on the ground for a few days before flying. And this is completely normal, but we often get phone calls from members of the public about this. A lot of people who phone up don't know that it's normal. So once you tell them that it is, they're happy with that. And then they hang up and they're happy with the bird being in their garden. But a lot of people phone and say, well, that's fine, but there's cats that hang about this garden, so I need that, that bird to go to Wildlife Rescue Centre. The thing is, it's quite rare anywhere in the UK not to have a cat about somewhere, and we can't take in every single baby bird of these species because it would be millions. It's basically would be every single bird of the whole species in the whole country. So we do have to make judgment calls. We have to sometimes say, we can't take it in, you'll just need to keep your cat inside for a bit or keep an eye out. The best thing for the bird is to stay with the parents and sometimes this may end up in them being caught by a cat or a fox or something else, but it is a difficult one. We'll sometimes take them in, but sometimes you just have to leave them because we just don't have the space for every single one. It's, it's happening up and down the country, so it can be a tricky one. Now let nature take its course. You'll sometimes get people say that they haven't picked up an animal that was injured because they should let nature take its course, even though this involves suffering. So obviously suffering is what we want to avoid. The whole reason that we exist as a wildlife rescue centre is so that things like that don't have to happen. However, if a bird of prey has attacked or is attacking another bird or a mammal, we have had people contact us who've thrown things at the bird of prey so that they fly away and then rescued that animal and brought it to us. The problem with that is that first of all, the bird of prey is then going to go and do the same to another animal. So it's basically now one animal injured and another animal injured or dead. But also the animal that's been so-called saved is 
often in a very bad position whereby it's so injured that either it needs put to sleep straight away or it dies on the way. So it's just prolonging the suffering of the animal for no reason at all. And I completely disagree with that. And yes, we're vegans, so we want to reduce suffering, but that's not something we should be inflicting upon the natural world. So now into the vegan section, even though, as you can see, I've mentioned veganism a lot already. Carnivorous animals and how to feed them. So birds of prey, for example, you can't just buy meat from a supermarket to feed a bird of prey. They need to get the roughage, like the bones and the fur or feathers, in order to have a proper diet. So while they rescue centres exist because of animal farming, or should I say they couldn't exist without it, as things are, we get day-old chicks, the ones that are discarded from the egg industry, already dead, which are fed to birds of prey and other carnivores. The thing is about this, it's not a matter of supply and demand in that the baby chicks already exist because they're a byproduct of the egg industry, which in my mind makes me feel a little bit better about it. But obviously, as a vegan, it's not something that sits entirely comfortably with me. But carnivorous, carnivorous animals exist. And there's things like milk powders as well when you're rearing baby animals. That's something that you also are contributing to the dairy industry for. And then you get things like mealworms and crickets. Again, there's the insectivorous food side of it as well. Lab-grown meat is something which could be a potential answer when it comes to people eating meat. So you could take the animal out of it by making it lab-grown. But because of birds of prey needing the roughage, the bones, that sort of thing, this wouldn't necessarily be a solution to this problem. I think it comes along the same vein as what to feed meat-eating companion animals. And I know there's obviously debate about which companion animals can or can't have a vegan diet, but I think we can all agree that some companion animals do need to eat meat, like snakes, for example. They can't be fed on vegetables or an alternative to meat. So judgment calls, and I put judgment calls as a vegan issue because we want to reduce suffering. But when we make a judgment call on whether an animal should be given a chance or not, it's even worse when this animal's wild because say you have a dog and that dog's ill or injured and they're given, say, 50-50 survival and you decide to give them that chance. So you're going to take them home, make them comfortable, give them food, medication, whatever it is they need to get better and just take the chances. And if they don't make it, then they might die at home peacefully or you can take them to a vet and say goodbye to them while they get put to sleep. But it's not the same with a wild animal because they are terrified of you and you're going to have to grab them daily to medicate them, potentially. It's not the same as having a companion animal at all. So if you prolong that suffering only for them to die, that is a horrible end for them, worse than if you just put them to sleep straight away. It's really hard because of that to make that judgment call. And you're putting your decisions and what you think is best on another animal. You get to decide what they get fed. You get to decide what medications they get put on, which may have side effects, that you're going to grab them every day. You get to decide when and where they get released. So you get to make that judgment call of whether or not they should be released where they came from, for example. And I think the mental health of the wild animals that people rehabilitate is something that's definitely not focused on enough because... There's not just the physical aspect, but there's also the mental toll it takes on the animals who have gone through this whole process and then be, get released somewhere they don't know. And a lot of the time that is necessary for various reasons. But it's something that I think as a vegan, you maybe notice on a certain level because you know that you're putting your decision onto that animal's life and everything you decide affects another's life, which is not something you want to do because... You want to help them, but you know that you're also terrifying them on a daily basis as well because they're wild and they're scared of you. So species bias or speciesism is something that I have seen in wildlife rehabilitation, not really from people I know, but just generally when you speak to wildlife rehabilitators, because there's obviously a lot of us out there. There's a tendency to get excited about a species that you hardly ever see that comes in. And I think this is completely fine. A rare bird of prey, for example. I've been excited about a goshawk coming in or a red kite coming in or an osprey and I think that's completely fine. But the thing is if you start to expend more time, effort or money on the animal because it's rare and exciting then you've then put a higher value judgment on that animal. The thing is 
The rare animals, I can understand completely why you might put more time, effort and money into them because every single individual of that species matters when it comes to how the species does as a whole. But I think, I think veganism is really all about the individual because if an individual is suffering of a disease or an illness, uh, sorry, or an injury, that's the individual suffering, not the species. So as wildlife rehabilitators, we need to focus on the suffering of the individual and the importance of that animal as an individual, not its species. But I think generally I, I've seen this, I've seen this quite well, like the places I've worked haven't been too bad in this sense. I think the animals are put first um, above their species, they're put first as individuals. And I think, I don't know if you understand what I mean, but basically the individual is treated more important than what species it is. So equal time and effort is put into everything. And I think that's really important. Another thing actually, uh, I mentioned at the bottom about non-native species, but some people, rehabilitators, just people in general, will maybe be less likely to either bring in or treat a pest or vermin. And I completely say that in inverted commas because I don't view any animal as pest or vermin. I think that's just a term we put on any animal that annoys us, which could be every single animal. Every single animal has uh, annoyed someone or taken someone's food or something like that. But if there's an animal which is seen as a pest or vermin, some places don't necessarily treat them and some people won't take them in because they don't deem them worthy enough, which again could be seen as an example of speciesism for this exact reason. So the human centrism point, I've mentioned it a lot and I'll probably mention it again. Places which have animals are often seen as a place where humans should get something out of it. So not so much in terms of veterinary surgeries, because I don't think I've ever heard of someone going into a vet and asking or even expecting a tour. But zoos, sanctuaries, aquariums, things like that, they're places where animals live and humans come in and they look around and they see the animals. But wildlife rehab centres are not this. They're not an entertainment for humans. They're a hospital and a recovery area for animals. Some do have open days or will occasionally give tours. But you need to remember these animals are wild and they're scared of people and they're only staying for a few weeks. It's not like from a young age they've been used to having people watch them necessarily. But because they're going to be released, you don't want them to get used to humans. If there's a baby mammal and there's humans walking past all the time, most likely that animal won't be fit for release at the end of this if they come in at a young age. And then there's things like wood pigeons, which are extremely stressy birds. If you put a wood pigeon in an aviary and someone walks past that aviary, there's every chance that wood pigeon is going to bash against the side of the aviary and injure themselves. So it's, it's just not an environment for humans to be looking around. But you do get people who say things like, oh, I've traveled really far. Can I not at least get a tour? And again, there's time constraints, so we can't give them a tour even if we wanted to. But we aren't a zoo, we're a place for animals to recover. And people don't always understand this because they think, oh, it's animals, so it must be somewhere I can look around. And some days you'll come out and you'll just see someone walking around looking at the animals and you'll have to go up and say, oh, I'm sorry, we're not open to the public. But it's just so ingrained in people that if there's a place with enclosures and animals, it must be somewhere for people to look around and get some sort of entertainment out of it. You've probably noticed that I've interchanged between saying it and them or she, he or whatever in this talk. Growing up, I said it when talking about animals because I think most of us have grown up with that language. Then when I became vegan, I started to say they, so singular they. But when doing well the rehabilitation, I did notice that people would say, oh, they, I thought it was just one or oh no, it was just one. So then I started to say she, he to talk about these animals. But then you get people saying, oh, I didn't realise it was a female, or oh, I didn't realise it was a male, I thought it was the other, or how do you know? And then I've got to explain to them, no, I'm just trying not to say it. But from experience, I found the easiest way of doing it is to say he or she, because people will then ask you if you know the gender or the sex, and you'll just say no, it's just because I'm, I'm saying she or he, that's just what I automatically do. And I think that's the easiest way of doing it. But I do sometimes shift between the two because sometimes when you talk to people, it's just easier to say it because most people will understand it. And it's now kind of bled over into my normal day to day language, which is not what I want, because language is really important. The way that you talk to people, the words like pest and vermin, they're words that I would like to think most vegans try and avoid. And I think language kind of 
makes people realize how you think. If you call animals them, some people don't like it being used like that, but it also shows that you don't see animals as objects. And then not saying vermin or pest, again, shows the same thing, that you don't see animals in that light. So language is an important way of portraying how you feel about something. I mean, I now say RTC instead of RTA if I'm putting a reason for an animal coming in. I used to put RTA, which means road traffic accident. But having seen over the years how many RTAs aren't actually accidents at all, or how many people just leave the animals there, I now say RTC, which is road traffic collision. It doesn't really make a difference to anything, but I just feel better in myself because I know that I'm almost taking the blame out if I call it an accident. And it doesn't really affect anyone other than me, but it's just something I do now. I think as vegans, use of language is very important. So the point I'm really trying to say there is that it's just about talking in a way which maybe transfers over to other people. And from experience, people have said to me before that the way I talk about pigeons and gulls, which are commonly disliked animals, has sort of inspired them to see them in a different light. And that's really important because I'm going to mention this on one of the last slides, but there's a thing called an enthusiasm infection where your excitement for an animal or not just an animal, but anything that people don't usually have any interest in can make them see that actually it can be something interesting and can be something worth caring about. So yeah, use of language is a big one, I think. And just to finish as well for this slide, the bottom right picture of the two corvids, they're um, two jackdaws which live with me. So I said at the beginning about how you can't keep the non-tame animals captive and how even if they are tame, you can't really keep them captive just because of space constraints, unfortunately. But these two, they were tamed shortly after coming in because they were disabled and they live with me now. And I'd say they, they have a pretty good life. They, they do a lot of things and um, they, seem, they seem happy anyway. So they're my two babies down there. So unfortunately, I have heard, or should I say technically seen, because it was on a social media page, the term, the only way to have a cruelty-free world is to get rid of every carnivorous animal. And a vegan said that. And I just wanted to really briefly explain why I think that's a load of rubbish. Pest control, firstly. A lot of animals which are deemed pests are herbivorous. And if you take away the top predator, then these animals will then do better. And then humans will intervene and cull them. For example, rabbits and mixed mitosis and culling in general. If more animals were keeping these animals, uh, keeping the rabbits lower in number, then there wouldn't be a need for this. And there's a fine balance in any ecosystem Everything sort of keeps each other in check, apart from humans, basically. And interfering with this can create a big problem. And trophic cascade is when the top predator is taken out and it affects the other animals beneath this in a food chain or food web, as I will show you here. So this is a very, very simplified food web. But you can see the top predators here are foxes, hawks and owls and snakes. So what happens if we remove the top predator? So you can now see that there'll be a boom in insectivorous birds and toads, and this is called mesopredator release, where basically these species do really well. And there'll also be a boom in rabbits, squirrels, mice, and seed-eating birds, because nothing is predating them anymore. So this means there'll be a decrease in plants, and that's because these animals will boom in numbers, so overall the population will be eating a lot more of the plants. There'll also be a decrease in the insects, because the insectivorous birds and the toads are up in number. There will be higher competition because there'll be more of each individual of the species and disease will not be taken out of the populations because if an animal, say a rabbit, is lying there dying of disease, maybe if there are predators, the predator would come and pick that animal up and kill them and then eat them. But if there are no predators to take them out of the game, then they're just going to be either lying there or still with other members of the species because they're weak, but there's nothing predating them. And this means disease spreads more and is really bad for the populations. And then again, culling will occur because humans will say there's too many rabbits, too many squirrels, too many mice, and also because there'll be fewer plants, so maybe their crops are being eaten and so they cull those animals. It really just gets rid of the balance. So here, if we get rid of every single predator, we've just got the herbivores left, so the populations of all of these will boom and there'll be a huge decline in plant life. Again, disease won't be removed from the populations, so it'll spread quickly amongst the populations, even between populations, because of the highly populated environments, which is bad for every population individually. 
And again, humans will come along and say, you're eating too many of our plants and culling will occur. So the point I'm making really is that the fine balance is disrupted if you get rid of the top predators. And as vegans, this is a behavior that we can, we can make, we can decide to be vegan, but it shouldn't be imposed on the natural world. And this picture just shows really before and after trophic cascades. So you take away the top predator, you might think it's better for nature, but as you can see from this, it's, well, there's a lot less biodiversity. It's uh, a lot less interesting and there's a lot less going on. So I'll just um, keep the slide on for a couple of seconds more, just so you can read if you're interested, the difference between before and after. But as I say, it's basically just a lot more going on in the first one. You get rid of the top predator and everything changes. And it's sort of the problem that uh, we have today, you know, people saying there's too many deer and they need culled. And this is an exact um, result of trophic cascade, basically. And it's not just in this scenario, there's, there's other scenarios in the UK and other countries where this is the problem when you get rid of top predators, as has been done in the UK. So what are the solutions to the conflicts that I discuss? A large one is education. So, for example, you sometimes get a volunteer come in and you ask them to maybe feed the bird of prey, the birds of prey, or even just do something around the area that the baby chicks or the chicks are stored. And they'll see the day old chicks and they'll get really upset by it and they'll just be disgusted. And sometimes they're vegetarians, sometimes they're meat eaters. But then it gives you a chance to say, oh, do you realize where these come from? These are byproducts of the egg industry. The industry that you support by eating eggs is where these chicks come from. And it does make a lot of people question what they're doing, because if you can see in person the direct result of the way that you're eating, I think it has a lot more of an effect than seeing it on a TV or hearing about it. And then again, the effect of lethal pest control is something you see on a day-to-day -day basis. In wildlife rescue, you'll see things coming in poisoned by slug pellets, things that have been shot, things caught in snares, uh, things entangled in fishing line. So it really makes people understand about the actions of either themselves or people they know and directly the effects they have on animals and also non-target species as well. For example, they might eat fish and they might be happy to eat fish, but there's so many animals that come in um, wrapped in fishing line or fishing nets and they'll realize actually their actions have consequences on other species which they don't want to be negatively affected by their behavior. So like I mentioned, an enthusiasm infection. I read a paper by someone from the RSPB a few years ago and they mentioned enthusiasm infection where you talk about something which other people aren't necessarily interested in with such passion that they then become interested in that thing. So if you can make someone who loves the wildlife understand that you love the farm animals, or at least not even love, but just respect enough not to eat or think about in the same sort of way, you know, I'm spending every single day putting my time and effort into helping these wild animals, which is why I'm vegan, because I don't want to be putting my effort in here and then not thinking about the farm animals as well. Some people think, oh yeah, that, no, that makes sense that she does that. And they might still eat meat, but you're just making people think about their behavior and, and why someone's doing what they're doing. And it can be a great way of kind of explaining why you're vegan. And obviously it's not just about your diet. Veganism is about the whole lifestyle, which as I said, with the whole um, fishing line pest control thing, it kind of links in that your behavior as a non-vegan is creating some of these things or not directly, but people's use and abuse of animals is creating these problems for the wild animals. So consistency in behavior is really just about treating every single animal that comes in with the same level of respect and showing that you don't view any species more important than another. And like I said, I don't think it matters at all if you get excited about a rare animal coming in, but it's just to show that you don't view a mouse or a rat as any less important than you do a pigeon, than you do a gull, than you do a sparrowhawk or a rabbit or anything. It's just good to be consistent. It's just a little point, um, mainly just ties into the, to the point above. So the spread of veganism as a lifestyle, not a diet. If the world, and I don't think the, the world will ever be a vegan world, but if the world was more focused on being animal friendly, I think there would be a lot of solutions for the conflicts I've mentioned before in wildlife rehabilitation. Wildlife rehabilitation is a product of the world it exists in. So if we lived in a world where, for example, people thought animal testing was abhorrent. And when I say people, I mean everyone, or at least 95% of people. 
then when new drugs came out, they wouldn't be tested on animals. They would have found other better ways of doing it by now. And when I say better, I mean even better than the ways they have at the moment. And in the same way as that, if the egg industry was suddenly not a thing anymore, wild rehabilitation wouldn't suddenly stop existing. We'd find other ways of doing it. And if science or scientists were more interested in helping animals in that sense, and there was more funding because it was generally something that everyone wanted, there would probably be a way of growing meat in a lab uh, with all the sort of roughage that the birds of prey need. So the point I'm making there is that while the rehabilitation isn't necessarily vegan friendly in that sense, but it's the product of the world it exists in. And I'll mention this again in a second. So first of all, what to do if you find an animal in need, wild animal this is. So if the problem isn't obvious, first of all, get advice before you do anything. You may find a deer or what you think is a baby rabbit, actually a leveret lying on the ground. If you pick the animal up and take it home, then that's it, it's now in captivity. But if you leave the animal on phone, you might then discover that actually the animal doesn't need help at all because this is completely natural behavior. A baby deer lying on its own or a baby leveret lying on its own is completely normal, so you don't need to do anything. So it's always best to phone in advance of acting, unless it's an absolute emergency, like something lying on a road or something about to get attacked by a cat or that has been attacked by a cat. So listen to the experts. You might not always agree with or like what they say, but most of the time they're saying what they're saying because they know. You might not think an animal is taken into captivity, for example, but if an expert on the phone is telling you they do for whatever reason, then they probably do and you should probably cooperate. After all, you did phone them, so there's not much point phoning them only to ignore what they say. Try your best, if asked, to take the animal into uh, a wildlife rescue centre. If you can't do it yourself because you don't drive, you're busy, see if a friend or a family member or a neighbour or something like that would be able to for you. Because wildlife rescue centres do sometimes have volunteer drivers, but they're usually just members of the public as well. And if you use a volunteer driver one day to help an animal, then the next day when it may be needed again, or even more so, you can't really call on them again. So it's really, really helpful if members of the public can take animals in themselves. Don't self-project, even if you think you know everything you need to know, even if you've done a Google search. You learn something every day in wildlife rehabilitation, and even people who've been doing it for years are learning more. So there's no way that a quick Google search, looking at a couple of websites, would teach you everything you need to know. And you won't have the resources anyway, whether that be time or incubators or the right food. So don't make the animal your project, take them into a wildlife rescue centre and some will give you a number so that you can find out how the animal's doing anyway so you don't have to completely let go of that animal and how it's doing. The most important thing usually is just to keep any animal that you do find warm, dark and quiet. So warm because it just helps with shock or they might have been out in the cold and uh, just need the warm really to do a bit better. It's amazing the difference that a bit of warmth can make to an animal. If they're a baby animal, they might need to get very warm, but that's kind of why it's important to get into a wildlife rescue centre as quickly as possible because they'll have incubators that can do this. Dark, because animals tend to stress out less in the dark and quiet for the same reason. So never force feed food or water. Even if you think an animal's dehydrated, do not syringe food or water into that animal. Don't syringe water because they don't know what you're doing. If a baby bird's gaping, that doesn't mean you should syringe water, that can still drown them. And food, because if an animal's in a really bad way and it hasn't had any water in a long time, feeding them can actually kill them itself. Don't allow children to handle them or introduce them to other animals because the other animal may behave badly towards them, but also because your animal, the animal that you found might have um, some sort of ectoparasite, which will then pass on to your animal. Don't treat it as a pet because it's not a pet. You sometimes hear of baby animals that are seen hopping about in someone's house and they say, oh, that animal seemed fine because it was hopping about a lot. But baby animals don't tend to hop about. So if they're running around, it most likely means they're hungry or there's something wrong. They might be agitated by uh, maybe fly eggs or maggots or something. So it's, you might think a behavior is good, but it isn't necessarily a good behavior for them to be exhibiting. Don't disturb them any more than necessary. It might be really exciting to you to have this animal in your house, but just leave them be. Don't keep them for any longer than necessary because they'll need expert uh, attention. Don't give them medication or attend to wounds. Although, as I said before, if the animal's bleeding really badly, then I think stemming the bleeding is probably the one thing that it's okay for you to do. And don't leave an animal in need if you have any choice at all. You sometimes get pictures sent in 
where someone's passed an injured animal, taken a picture of them with their phone, walked on and sent it to you. And either you turn up and the animal's gone or you, you can't turn up and there's nothing you can do about it. And then that just plays in your conscience for the rest of your day and it's not nice at all. So if you can, please stay with the animal. If you don't know how to pick an animal up and you're nervous about it, then that's something we can advise over the phone. So you can still phone up, but please, please don't leave them alone if you have any choice whatsoever. So little changes that you can make to help wildlife. And these are just small ones. There's a lot that you can do. These are just some little ones that I've come up with. So clean your bird feeders weekly. Bird feeders are great for birds, but they also harbor disease. And that's why you should really clean them a lot. There's a disease called trichomoniasis and it's really commonly spread on bird feeders. So you just take them down once a week, empty any uneaten food and just wash them in, you know, washing up liquid hot water or even a really diluted bleach solution and then put them back up. But don't let them become rusty because this causes problems in itself. You can see a picture on the right hand side. It's actually two pictures of two different starlings that have gotten stuck in bird feeders. And as you notice, both of these bird feeders were empty. So often when a bird feeder is empty or very low in food, birds can actually get caught in them. I wouldn't have included this picture if those birds had died of their injuries or being stuck. So you might be happy to know that both these birds were released and they are okay. So make your hedgehog, your hedgehog, make your garden hedgehog friendly. There's many ways you can do this. So in autumn, when you get leaves in your garden, you can sweep these all off into one side and leave them in a corner and don't disturb them because a hedgehog might use this as its nest over winter. You can, if you're allowed, cut a hole in your fence 13 centimetres by 13 centimetres, which is large enough for hedgehogs to walk through. As a vegan, hopefully you're not using slug pellets anyway, but if you do, then stop because hedgehogs can be killed by these. And in case you didn't know, slugs get killed by these too. So it's not good for the slugs either. But as I say, hopefully as a vegan, you're not using them anyway. You can leave um, a dish of water out, which doesn't just benefit hedgehogs, it benefits every animal. And this is something you can do all year round because even in winter, having fresh water is a great thing when all puddles and ponds are frozen over. And then you, well, if you feed your cats or dogs or other animal meat, then you can give them dried dog or cat biscuits or wet food as well. And hedgehogs do really well on this. You shouldn't be feeding, even if you don't want to feed them meat, you definitely shouldn't be feeding them mealworms or nuts or seeds or fruit or really anything other than that. And definitely don't feed them milk either. Although, you know, you're probably not feeding them milk if you're vegan because you don't have that in the house necessarily. Only use non-lethal control. Again, hopefully something which you're doing anyway. There's another talk in the, this veg fest by Kevin Yule, and he can tell you a little bit about that if he hasn't already. So that's something which you now have an option for if you didn't before. I've mentioned the dish of water. Uh, wildlife pond, you can find online how to make a wildlife pond. Sometimes it can even just be a basin and you just make it and make sure it has oxygenating plants in it and ponds are amazing for wildlife. But if you can try and make the pond have a gradient so that it's not just a sudden drop because if hedgehogs get stuck in ponds, they can drown. So it really helps them to have a gradient or any other animal as well that might get stuck. Join your local conservation groups. So there's bat groups, uh, amphibian reptile groups, that's ARG, amphibian and reptile group, or Zooniverse. If you live in Scotland and you're in or around the Lothians, the LARG, which is the Lothian Amphibian Reptile Group, is actually largely run by a vegan. So, you know, if you want to do things around other vegans or sometimes you might feel a bit disenfranchised about something. Uh, I say, for example, if there's an animal organisation that holds a barbecue to raise money for animals, a lot of vegans find that difficult. I do too, because you're raising money for one species by selling the bodies of another species. So... ARG or Lothian Amphibian Reptile Group LARG is a good one because you know that you're working with a vegan who'll have the same sort of principles. And then Zooniverse is good because it's a website which helps you do citizen science from your own home. So if you don't want to go out, especially at the moment, you don't want to go out and see other people necessarily, or you don't want to get involved in a group where you have to do things with other people. You might just feel more comfortable being at home or you might not be able to go out very much, as I say, especially at the moment, then Zooniverse helps you to help animals from your home, which is really cool. And it's a great website. I've used it before. Litter picking. It's easy. You can just be on a walk from A to B and find litter and pick it up. Animals so often get stuck in litter. We get them in quite a lot. It's, it's not a rare thing. So if you find litter, just pick it up. And for all you know, you've just saved an animal's life. 
And I've mentioned it further down, but I'll just say it now because it's the same sort of thing. If you are throwing away anything with a loop, just cut the loop like the carton seal from a carton of soy milk or uh, loops from a face mask, just always cut them so they're not looped because you do get a lot of animals that come in inside a loop. Keep an eye out for your local nest. So in summertime, make sure that no birds have flown for the nest. Um, make sure if there's cats about that you can try and deter them from your garden if possible. Leave your lawn alone. Don't mow your lawn for a considerable period if you're able to, or leave some of it unmown if you've got neighbours complaining or if you'd rather mow some of it. A mown lawn is really no good for nature at all, but a slightly overgrown lawn with so-called weeds is a lot better for nature. And the, uh, the plants that we see as weeds are usually good for animals in some, in some um, respect. So it is a, a lot better for nature to have an unmown lawn. Don't tame your foxes. If you're feeding foxes, then it's best to do it at the end of your garden and don't make them associate the food with you. If you've already tamed your foxes, and I'd say try and back off a little bit because it's fine if they come to you, but they'll go to someone else's garden who hates them and then they might get killed. And this is a really common occurrence. Support your local wildlife rescue centre. So you can donate with money. Um, if you've got old blankets or newspapers, they often want that. You could be a courier for them, so if you can drive, or even using public transport, you can then pick up an animal for them somewhere else sometimes, and it means that they don't have to try and send someone out, which most of the time they won't be able to do anyway. So couriers are so appreciated in wildlife rescue centres, so it's so helpful if you can be a courier. And keep your cats in check. I wouldn't say keep your cats indoors, because most people won't want to do that, but in summer, if you've got birds nesting in your garden and you can keep your cat indoors, even just until the birds have gone, then if you can, then at least try and do that because we get so many birds caught by cats. Cats kill millions of birds every single year. So anything you can do to keep your cats away from birds is really, really important. I know a lot of people give their cats collars with a bell on it, but first of all, this does nothing to protect nesting birds, well, sorry, birds in a nest, nestlings, or fledglings who haven't associated the fear yet with cats. And also some cats I've heard have actually learned to walk in a certain way that it doesn't trigger the bell, which is extremely clever, but you know, not great. Apparently having two bells can help because it's harder for them to walk in this way. But if you can just think of anything that you can do to make your cat less likely to predate on birds, then please do it. Because as I say, it really is millions of birds being killed by cats every year. And that's not an anti-cat thing at all. It's just a fact. So is wildlife rescue vegan friendly? It depends who veganism is for. So we're vegans and that's fine, but we don't need to impose our veganism on other species. So if you say that veganism is about our decisions, I think Wild Rescue you can be seen as, as vegan friendly because yes, we're feeding meat to others, but it's not us. We're doing it for animals that do need the meat or do need the milk powders, wherever it is we're giving them. It doesn't necessarily have a net benefit to the planet in that it produces a lot of waste and we use electricity and we use our cars a lot, for example. But I think veganism is really about seeing animals as individuals. And so I think in this sense, it's completely worth it. I mean, I don't think many people question human hospitals because they produce a lot of waste or because they use a lot of electricity. We understand that if humans need help, they should get the help. And it's the same with the animals. They might they might have a diet that we as humans don't agree with, but that's not something we can impose on them or something we can really stop them from doing. It's along the same lines as sort of let nature take its course. We don't put that onto humans. We don't say if a human's ill with a disease, we should let nature take its course. No, we say that we should treat the human and in the same way you should treat the animals, even if they're not herbivores, which as I showed with the whole food web thing, they're equal anyway, and they have just as much importance in an ecosystem as the herbivores do. They, they all do, they all play a part. Helping animals is in line with vegan principles. So in that sense, yes, while the rehabilitation is always going to be vegan friendly because you're helping animals. And as I said, it's a product of the world that it exists in. So it doesn't have to be one that uses animals. It's just one which at the moment does, just in the same way as drug production involves animal testing. It doesn't mean it necessarily has to in future when science and human behavior can kind of maybe find a solution to that. I mean, as I said before, dead animals which have died in captivity can be used to feed others. In the same way, animals which are roadkill can be used to feed um, 
well, to feed the predators. So if we lived in a world that was more animal friendly, more people might find roadkill animals and take them to wildlife rescue centres to be used as food. And then wildlife rescue centres would get more funding. Um, they would have more volunteers. There'd be less of a demanding public because they'd understand that it's an animal service, not a human service. Fewer animals might be hurt because there'd be less animal cruelty and fewer non-target species. There'd be more education so people would know what to do if they found an injured animal. There'd be more habitat for animals and more animals would be helped so fewer might need to be taken in the first place. So my finishing line is that a vegan world could create a more animal friendly wildlife rescue service. As I say, I don't think the world will ever be fully vegan, but the point I'm making really is that wildlife rescue is the product of the world we're in. And so it can get better and it helps animals. So I don't think as vegans, we can ever say that that's wrong, especially as a lot of what is used is byproducts and is something which we can overcome if people want to overcome those issues. If we want animals, sorry, if we, if we want to find a way for wildlife rescue to be done in as animal friendly a way as possible, that's something that we as humans can overcome in the future. So if you want to know more, you can email me with any questions on flowblackborn at gmail.com. I've also got a podcast called Talk Wildlife Podcasts, and we talk about some of the issues. So things wildlife rehabilitators wish you knew, and also how to help nature during lockdown and the art of feeding birds in your garden mention a few other things, as well as a lot of the ones that I've included about what you can do to help animals. To find more about wildlife rescue Sorry, to find more out about Wildlife Rescue in general, you can read Something in a Cardboard Box by Les Stocker, who was an amazing wildlife rehabilitator. He was like, one of those people that you just aspire to be. And BBC Scotland, Born to be Wild, which you may be able to watch on Catch Up sometime, which is just about the SSPCA and their Wildlife Rescue Centre. Although, do understand that they have a lot more funding than most Wildlife Rescue Centres, so in that sense, it is a little bit different. These are some pictures which I didn't have space to include in the main talk, but I just thought you'd like them. So the middle one is a robin sleeping among three baby starlings, which is very cute. And I think the other ones speak for themselves. Although bottom right was really exciting getting a cuckoo in. Uh, that was really cool. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed your talk. And um, there's probably things I've said which you disagree with. And when I went into wildlife rescue, a lot of the things I thought then are different to what I think now. So I am very much a product of wildlife rescue centers, which is, it's kind of two separate levels, veganism and wildlife rescue, they do clash, but I hope you've uh, enjoyed the talk and maybe learned something about wildlife rescue in the process and feel free to email me. And I'm sure some of you will disagree with things I've said, but that's fine. As long as someone's helping wild animals, I think that's, that's the most important thing.